Hey, it's Guy Raz here, and welcome back to The Great Creators. This is where I have conversations with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. Today's guest is Jewel, and you're about to hear her incredible life story from yodeling in bars as a kid. It was biker bars, lumberjack joints, fisherman haunts, uh, some pretty rough places. To becoming homeless at age 18. I sometimes couldn't get off the street corner I was on, out from under this tree that felt safe to me. Um, couldn't go out and get food most days because I was I would have a panic attack if I left this little tree. To just a short time later, becoming the most sought after musician in the world. I was offered a million dollar signing bonus and that wasn't a solve to my problems. That actually was a problem I had to solve. But all of that and the 30 million albums sold are just a part of Jewel's story. And this is one of the most honest, compelling, and tactical episodes we've ever done on the show. You'll hear about the mental exercises Jewel used to climb out of homelessness, how she designed a business plan, an actual business plan for her career, and how a conversation with Bob Dylan may have saved her career. This is one of our longer episodes, but it is so compelling, you're going to love it. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jewel. Um, let's start with with your, uh, and I know you've, you've, you've written about this, you've written a book about y- y- your life. It came out more than 20 years ago, and your life has changed considerably um, since then. But I do want to go back a little bit and talk to you about... Um, sort of the origins of your story, um, because I know it began in Utah, but but quickly moved to Alaska, where you grew up mainly with with uh, with your dad um, in a very remote part of Alaska. Um, some people know about it because it's been <laughs> featured on a, a Discovery Channel documentary. Tell me what what your memories were like as a child living living there. Yeah, my family were homesteaders. They left Germany just before the Second World War. And my grandmother had been an aspiring opera singer and poetess, and she raised her children, her and my grandfather, on a homestead uh, where Alaska would give you a free piece of land if you went up there and promised not to die for a whole winter. Um, So all the kids were born up there as if it was the 1800s. It was a horse and wagon to town. It was you know, no grocery stores. Um, My dad went to Vietnam and got to go to college on the GI Bill. And that's how we ended up in Utah when I was born. And as soon as he graduated college, we went back to Alaska. My mom left when I was eight. And then I started living on the homestead with just my dad, lived in a saddle barn. I loved it. Um, I really loved the homestead. I really loved the land. I always felt uh, very lucky to have the relationship that I did with the land. It's a relationship. Uh, I think that's the thing I was the most homesick for. And the thing that yeah. I think, surprisingly, as I look back, gave me one of the best uh, skill sets to handle my career, oddly. Um, your dad, as you mentioned, um, was on the GI Bill. He was a, a Vietnam veteran. Um, and I guess later in life, it, it became clear to you that he had he, he he had suffered was suffering from post traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, uh, we didn't have a term for it, really. Probably at the beginning of, of of that time. What do you remember about you know being I don't know eight nine ten years old and seeing your dad suffer? Yeah, you know my dad's childhood was so traumatic that when he went away to Vietnam, it was the first time he felt his body relax. That is. Hmm. So awful. You know, then he went and did what good guys do at that age. They get married to their sweetheart and they come home. And then when my mom left when I was eight, me and my two brothers, he took over raising us. And today we would call it trauma triggering. But that nomenclature just didn't exist back then. My dad started to drink to try and handle the intense amount of emotional disruption that he was experiencing. That went rather predictably. And so suddenly at eight, you know, I went from this very nice normal family to my dad drinking and smoking and being physically abusive and we were singing in bar rooms so it was just a massive uh culture shift for me the thing i remember the most was that i was in pain and what i had a front row seat to front row seat to in the bars where i was singing we did five hour sets was watching people in pain i'm dyslexic so i i 
I didn't know it then, but my brain sees patterns in just a really different way. And one of those first patterns I saw was, why doesn't anybody talk about pain? I bet I watched people dealing with it by doing heroin, PCP, volatile relationships, drinking, um, people that never outran pain. And so I remember taking notes in my book, You Don't Outrun Pain, uh, seeing people, what I saw as a mountain covering up this sort of original insult or pain that they would cover up in all these now what I would call behaviors, coping mechanisms, drug relationships, and then I would see them die. And nobody won. Uh, nobody outruns that pain. And so for me, I remember reading that the buffalo was the only animal that went into the heart of a storm. And I was like, that makes so much sense. Like, I need to be the buffalo. I have to go the quickest ways through. And writing started to take me through. It took me toward the pain instead of avoiding the pain. And that one little shift started to change the course of my life. You, you mentioned playing in bars with your dad, and he was, I mean, this is before, I think really before you started playing guitar, you would, he, he would play guitar and the two of you would sing together? Yeah, we did bars all over Alaska. It was biker bars, lumberjack joints, fisherman haunts, uh, some pretty rough places. Also some family restaurants and kind of normal things. Uh, my dad was a singer-songwriter, and so it was his original material, as well as lots of covers. Uh, I had a kind of funny musical childhood. I heard my dad singing Heartbreak Hotel, but I never heard Elvis. I never heard mm. the Beatles. I never heard the Rolling Stones. I never heard Jim Croce. But I was singing all their songs from a young age, mostly harmony. I just did backup for my dad. What, what, I mean, was there music played at home? You know, we didn't have electricity most of my life, so I read a lot. And so I was very influenced by literature. My first writing wasn't music. It was poetry. It was short story fiction. It was essays. Um, writing songs didn't come till later, but what I was reading really affected the type of writer I would ultimately become very drawn to the really honest writers that didn't use their art as propaganda. I was fascinated by Bukowski. I found it heroic, not because I wanted to be an alcoholic, because I wanted to be honest, because I really admired some, it's funny, it moves me to tears just talking about Bukowski's writing. He really showed me who he difficult was. Difficult writing, difficult stuff to read, especially as a teenage, I mean, teenage girl. For teenage boys, it's challenging too, but it's challenging. I don't know. I mean, maybe it just, I was seeing all this in bar rooms. Some of my earliest, yeah. earliest memories is being a 10-year-old girl and a man putting a dime in my hand and folding my fingers around it and saying, call me when you're 16, you're going to be great to F when you get older. So that's the kind of thing I was around. So I didn't find Bukowski particularly shocking. I also never felt like I was in danger of emulating somebody's lifestyle because I admired their honesty. I admired his honesty. I didn't admire his yeah. drinking particularly. Yeah. I read Anais Nin's journals. You know, it's also pretty rough stuff to read when you're young. But it didn't make me sexual at a young age. It made me courageous as a writer. How did you? How did you tell me how you did that? Because I know you you're living in a remote place. I know. And, and we'll talk about when you left to to Michigan to go to high school. But uh, I mean, first of all, how did you have how were you exposed to that work? And then given that you had dyslexia, how did you physically read it? How did you sit down and like absorb the words? Yeah, I moved a lot as a kid. It wasn't all just on the homestead. And so I did miss a lot of consistency in my education at big, big holes, you know, one school wouldn't start a grammar curriculum until the second semester, but then I moved yeah. and the school had already started it in the first semester. So I spent most of my life feeling very stupid, thinking I was very stupid. Um, it wasn't until I had a teacher that um, was into philosophy and he was teaching young kids philosophy kind of as an experiment. And I was so intrigued by what he was saying. It was the first time I heard, was, what is it, maybe a stoic concept that mm -hmm. happiness doesn't depend on what you have or who you are. It depends on your thoughts. I was very interested in happiness. I was very unhappy. And so when I heard that, I really perked up. And it really motivated me to just, I had to figure reading out. I wasn't going to get at those ideas that I was super curious about until I could figure out how to read better. I just developed a system for myself through trial and error where I took a white piece of paper and I would take a razor blade and cut a single sentence without. Hmm. 
And then I would use that to hold it over the page. What I had a problem with was I saw the white on a page. I didn't see the black. I saw the negative space. And so I'd see all these squiggles going down through the columns that my brain was trying to make a pattern out of or a language out of, but clearly didn't work. So when I limited the amount of information I had in my vision, it worked. And then it was painstaking because I had to then rewrite it in my own words. And so reading Plato, reading whatever, Kant, reading anything, I had, I basically had a notebook where the entire document, the entire work was translated in my own words. But I mean, it's a very painful process, but I was really in love with the concepts. I felt like I was going to learn something that was going to change my life. And I was, this is the age where I was looking at moving out. And I knew that was dangerous. And I knew that, I don't know, I felt like they had some kind of secret or key to me moving out and not being a statistic. So I took it really seriously and it 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 paid off. My comprehension ended up being really good because of the painstaking way I went about it. And then my teacher let me teach a class and I was able to teach kids and that started to really build my confidence. You didn't grow up I mean when you you, you were singing in bars with your dad and clearly obviously you had a a gift um and I'm sure people in Alaska saw it but you weren't – I imagine you didn't grow up when you were 12, 13, 14 years old thinking, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I mean, we've interviewed lots of people on the show who you know, went that route and knew that was oh. what they were going to pursue. This was not your – right. I mean, it was just a thing you did, right? It was. It was very blue-collar. Um, singing – bar singing is not a glamorous gig, you know. I always got paid. Um, yeah, it's just cover songs for drunks for five hours, you know, people that aren't listening yeah. to you. And people would watch me sing since I was young. I'd been on stage since I was five uh, with my family. They did shows really early on in hotels. But, you know, I kind of chalked that up to being a child yodeling on stage. It's yeah. a novelty. Yeah. I didn't take it overly personally. I was intrigued and smitten with music. I was... um very fascinated with the puzzle of vo vocal control. I sang all day, every day, practiced all day, every day, but it wasn't because mm. I thought I was going to be a singer. It was just, it's like doing a crossword, you know, you just, your brain really likes it and it was intriguing. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't like sitting there practicing. I just did it all day, every day while I was doing other stuff. Um, I think also maybe just the way I lived in such a remote place, kids like me don't get famous. It, it just wasn't yeah. even in the realm of the world of what I thought was possible. And so for some reason, and I also just had more serious things to think about, like paying rent at too young of an age and things like that. Yeah, I think as you moved out of your dad's place, and I think you were 15, um, did you, I mean, in terms of, of singing, right? I mean, what, you know, you mentioned that you would sing and practice all the time. What what would you sing? I mean, were you listening to, to pop radio in Alaska? Were you picking up like, I mean, this is the 80s. So, I mean, were you picking up like 70s folk music? Like what, what do you, what were, like what was the music that moved you? Um, really limited exposure to pop culture. Um. I remember going to a friend's house and seeing MTV. Like I remember seeing um, uh, Huey Lewis. <laughs> For some reason, I remember obviously Madonna. You know, I was aware of Cyndi Lauper. Um, none of that really particularly moved me. Again, I just I think I think when you're raised reading, you're raised in that habit. And you know, my tastes started to really um, show what I was trying to solve for in my life. Like, I loved Chekhov. I loved that he wrote about ordinary people. You were hearing about ordinary people, the struggle of ordinary people. I didn't like, um, what's her name that wrote? Uh, oh, Jane Austen. I Jane didn't Austen. like her writing. It just, it didn't have anything to do with my life. And in fact, I love Bronte had an amazing quip about Jane Austen's writing of, Jane knows much about doilies and human pleasantries, but nothing of the human heart. I mean, what a burn. Mm -hmm. um, I tended toward the writers, uh, Flannery O'Connor, um, a lot of the Russian revolutionary writers that were writing during political upheaval, the poets that wrote during political upheaval. That's what I was really drawn yeah. to. And so pop music didn't really hold my 
sway particularly. Mm. I did run across a few singers that made me sit up, and I did study them. I studied Ella Fitzgerald. I studied Cole Porter's writing. Um, I studied Odetta. Um, mm -hmm. I studied Josephine Baker, oddly. Um, I think Sarah this is Vaughan when you. Later. I think this is when you when you left to go to. I think at age fifteen, you were. You got an opportunity to go study at an arts academy, a famous arts academy in Michigan. Um, and I think one, uh, somebody who's who's running a dance studio in in Homer Anchorage, right? Homer, Homer, who yeah. recommended that you go. Um, so you that was really when you began to receive formal training. I'd call it studying prior to school. I began to. I found Ella Fitzgerald maybe one or two years prior to that. I found Sarah Vaughn one or two years prior to that. Um, and so I studied singing, I think, from the best singers because I learned I learned to mimic their voices perfectly, um, which teaches you a tremendous amount of control. Uh, if you can do all those colors and those tonal shifts, Ella Fitzgerald, for instance, is incredibly agile. Um, her tone changes are very bright. It's quick. Her pitch is lethal. Like she's a sniper, you know, when she starts to scat and move so quickly with such perfect pitch. Sarah Vaughn had tremendous vocal uh, breath control. And where she would put her breath, that's the first time I learned how to place my breath up here versus narrow here versus down here versus down here. I learned those tricks from her um, just by listening and trying to figure out how to make those sounds. And then I got invited, you know, partial scholarship to this prestigious art school where I was supposed to study opera. That was just, I was a bar singer. So it was so odd um i did learn an aria for my audition just kind of learned it off of a tape by ear i don't read music um got accepted my town helped me raise money helped me raise ten thousand dollars to go i showed up like a wild animal like i hitchhiked from detroit i don't know how far is that a couple hundred miles probably to my school and nearly got kicked out because i had a large hunting knife like i had a skinning knife on my belt which they really frown upon in the finer establishments. So you were like out. a you were like a real sort of fish out of water there. It was really shocking for me to go uh, to that boarding school. Um, yeah, it was the only one. Very few scholarship kids. I was definitely the only one on my own. Like I didn't have parents. I didn't people checking in on me. It was. Uh, I started having panic attacks at that age. Mm. I didn't know what was happening. I had my first panic attack at school. I couldn't afford books and food. I was shocked that for $15,000, books and food were still on me to pay for. <laughs> so I had to get a job. You know, I got two jobs in high school to work my way through high school. So it, it really was a trip. I, I want to go back to, to this idea of like Chekhov and Bukowski and Anais Nin and, you know, some of these, Emily Bronte. I'm trying to sort of figure out how you connected with, I mean, you mentioned that you connected with their stories of pain and of, you know, of, I mean, they're writing, a lot of these writers are writing about working people. Um, but here you are, kid in, in Alaska. You know, I'm thinking about my time when I was 14, 15. I, I, those books seemed impenetrable to me because I didn't understand the world that they lived in. I didn't have the historical context. Um, even Jane Austen, who, you know, we were forced to read that in school, it, it didn't, move me because I didn't live in that world. I didn't understand it. Um, so how, how, how did, you, I mean, how did that even happen? You know, it is, it's unusual for any 15 year old, but for a kid living in, in Alaska without the infrastructure around her um, to support that, that, that work, how did that happen? How did you, how did you connect with that writing and understand it? On two levels, the writers I gravitated to had a huge emotional brute force. Yeah. Um, I liked writers that were really getting at the heart. And so what era it was set in really wasn't relevant. I had so much matter. struggle in my life. Yeah. Not really. It's just sort of like, yeah. did they wear jeans or did they wear tweed? I don't, it just didn't matter. The emotional thrust of what was being portrayed, I really related to because I was a really I was struggling. I was struggling emotionally. Um, I was struggling to figure life out. And I, I really did think like my, my answers, I would find them. I really believed that, you know, 
reading civilization is discontents would benefit me you know that freedom doesn't come without discipline i benefited from that concept i was trying to figure out how to apply these to make my life better um and they did they benefited my life and when i moved out i knew it was very dangerous statistically the movie doesn't end well when you leave an abusive house and you move out on your own like it goes bad yeah. really quickly and so it was through kind of what I thought was magical, you know, when I learned to read Socrates and the idea of the dialectic that through a conversation, a new thing can be mm. discovered that wasn't known before. And when I realized you could do that with yourself, when I realized you could ask yourself a question and you come up with an answer, that's weird. You sit down with nothing and then you get something. That's that's the sorcerer's stone. That's a strange little magical process you're participating in. And for somebody who felt very disempowered with no role models, with no guides, I really leaned on the ideas in these books and tried to be loyal to them. And so, again, like moving out at 15, I was like, is happiness a learnable skill? Is that a teachable skill? If I have a genetic inheritance, do I have an emotional inheritance? Is that emotional inheritance a language? You know, it leads to abuse and addiction. I can see it every generation in my family. Can I learn a new emotional language? I kind of felt empowered like I could. And I think it's because I read people who did ambitious things. They thought ambitious things. And they usually started at my age. And it's not that I thought I was particularly smarter. It just felt like the only ladder that I had to climb out of my situation. So... You know, we've had um, in in the past. We've uh, just thinking about conversations with like Kelly Clarkson on on this show or Melissa Etheridge, who consciously moved to Los Angeles to pursue this dream. You know, and and thousands, tens of thousands of people do this every year, and you know, most of them don't make it. You moved to San Diego after you finish high school. What what was your plan? Was it to pursue a dream of being a professional singer or was it more ambiguous? Definitely not to pursue being a singer. Um, nobody talked to me about college. Looking back, I probably could have got a full ride somewhere. But mm -hmm. I guess my yeah. school thought my, my parents would do that. I don't know. So it just wasn't on the horizon. I just and knew your, I had to and go your out. Mom was out of your mom was out of the picture pretty much. We stayed in touch time. through letters. You know, I, I tried to stay in touch and have a relationship with my mom. That's a super complicated topic. In my mind, I had a very strong yeah. relationship with my mom. <laughs> um, now, was that super supportive and traditional? Not at all. But I did go to San Diego to take care of her. She had heart problems and she was mm -hmm. really struggling with her health. And so I moved there because she was there and because she needed help paying rent. And so I just got normal, you know. I was a hostess in a restaurant. Um, I was a hostess in a coffee shop. Really struggling to pay rent, really struggling, like stealing toilet paper and, you know, things like mm -hmm. that to, to get by. And, and you were, I mean, this is like 1992, roughly. I think you're there in San Diego. Um, and as you, as you knew how to do, you knew that you could make money, some money, singing at you know bars and restaurants and coffee shops and and i guess you started to do that in order to generate some income to pay rent um not right away at first it was i'd never done solo shows i just started writing okay. songs um very private really was never for public i did street sing some for money um i got normal jobs to pay rent and then one of my bosses propositioned me. Um, and when I wouldn't have sex with him, he wouldn't give me my paycheck. Hmm. I knew I was going to get kicked out. My mom and I, I was late in my rent. My landlord had met, you know, hit his limit. And so I knew the price I was paying by not sleeping with my boss was most likely that my mom and I were going to get kicked out. Hmm. But I'd been propositioned my whole life in bars. Like I wasn't. I wasn't starting now, you know, it, it, it wasn't even a, a question for me. And so I was willing to pay the price. Um, my mom and I both lived in our cars. I thought I would just get another job um, and I would save up first and last month's rent. Uh, and then we'd get back on our feet. I just kept having problems. Like I had health issues, I had bad kidneys, I kept missing work. 
I kept getting fired from jobs. I was having a hard time getting other jobs. Um, my mom went back to Alaska. I stayed in San Diego in my car thinking, I'll figure this out. Like, this will turn around. Um, but it just got worse and worse. My health got worse. I almost died in the emergency room parking lot of a... They wouldn't see me because I didn't have insurance. I had sepsis. A doctor had seen me get turned away, luckily, and I was in the car covered in my own vomit, and he found me in my car and gave me antibiotics, and it saved my life that night. Um, saw me for free for a whole year while I was homeless. It was during this time, once I, I mean, I was applying at 7-Eleven, but you start looking homeless, it's rough. Like, the poverty cycle, it was very difficult to get out of. Um, my car got stolen. Um, so I was homeless there for a little while, and uh, I was like, maybe I can get a gig in a coffee shop. Like, maybe I can go back to doing what I did as a kid. It wasn't to get discovered. It was literally just to get, like, that first and last month's rent, you know, to get a down payment on an apartment. You know, you, you mentioned this idea of, of stoicism earlier that you learned when you were a teenager that, that you, can, you can think – you can choose to be, you know, happiness is a choice, right? You can essentially, and, and that's an oversimplification, but, you know, I wonder, I often wonder when I see people who are homeless, unhoused people, I live in, in the Bay Area, so when I'm in San Francisco, and, and every single one of those people, like, was born somewhere and lived in a home at some point with a parent or maybe two, and something happened, and they ended up where they, they, they were. on, And maybe the first few days of being homeless, they were mentally there. But over time, just the experience has to weigh on you. And it's sort of like, it's a bad analogy, but it's like the Stanford prison experiment, you know, in the 70s, where they put all these students um, in, in a confined space. And within 72 hours, virtually all of them kind of lost their mind. And it, it just shows you the fragility of the human mind, like all of us who think we're sane, we're normal, we're mentally fit, we all have the capacity to break down very quickly. And I wonder, I mean, you mentioned being homeless for a year. How did you, how, how was your mental state? How did you, how did you, I mean, how did you function on a on a day-to-day -day basis? It was very difficult. The two scariest times in my life up to that point were moving out and then being homeless. The great thing is I knew I should be scared. And when you're really scared and you really have no safety net, you, you can get very strategic. And so each time, probably maybe just because what I was reading, I, my only safety net I felt like was I was doing something wildly dangerous, and that meant there was no room for error. There was everything relied on what I was going to do day to day. And so it did cause me to develop strategies that were, you know, incredibly helpful. <laughs> and that ended up being the basis of my work and what I do now, which is really wild. But two incredible things came out of that time in my life. You know, to paint a mental picture, I was having panic attacks constantly. I was having constant illness. Um, I was agoraphobic, which is a fear of leaving your home, which when you don't have a home is really exasperated uh, to the point where, like, my life was just ground to a halt. I sometimes couldn't get off the street corner I was on, out from under this tree that felt safe to me. Um, couldn't go out and get food most days because I, I would have a panic attack if I left this little tree. I was shoplifting. And that was where. You know, I had this lofty goal when I was 15, remember? I don't want to be a statistic. I did kind of good. I mean, I got myself through high school, didn't end up on the stripper pole, <laughs> wasn't a drug addict. But one day I was in a dressing room and I was shoving a dress down my pants and I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I am a statistic. I am a homeless kid stealing. And if I get caught and I go to jail, this is a moment in my life I'll never, this is a forever lifestyle shift. But I couldn't stop stealing. I couldn't. I really was addicted. It was a real addiction. And that was so interesting to me because I didn't drink and I didn't do drugs. How did I get addicted? What was addiction? That got me very curious. Um, 
preceding that, actually, in that moment in the mirror when I was stealing that dress, I remembered that quote of happiness doesn't depend on who you are, what you have, it depends on what you think. And I was like, this is your moment, Kilcher. Like, this is your moment. Will you turn this around one thought at a time? I couldn't tell what I was thinking. Now I would call that disassociative. All I knew is I, I couldn't witness my thoughts in real time. And that was a problem if you're going to turn your life around one thought at a time. So my solve was, what if your hands are the servants of your thought? What if I could notice my thoughts by watching my actions? And so I dedicated myself to just writing down everything my hands did for two weeks, thinking maybe I'd figure out what I was thinking, and then maybe I could figure out how to think something differently. So at the end of two weeks, I literally was like writing down at 1024, I opened the car door, you know, at 1032, I opened the bathroom door, whatever. At the end of two weeks, I sit down, I'm trying to look for, I have no idea what I'm looking for. But then it dawns on me, I had not had a panic attack in two weeks. That was a wild side effect of this experiment that I couldn't figure out how to explain. And what I had stumbled on was mindfulness. What I stumbled on was being so radically present that I didn't have time to play what I call my scary movie that would get my system worked up. I learned, and then it took practice, how to stay present. I realized my anxiety, my worry, was a misuse of my creativity. What if I could channel my creativity to get really curious instead of really worried? Um, it was like, my worry was like trying to keep, trying to protect my house from robbers by leaving my house to go look for robbers. It's probably best to stay in your house. What I'd learned was learning how to stay in my house, as it were. And then that led me, that felt powerful. Like once I could figure out I could make an effect on my panic attacks, I knew I was onto something. And then I started picking one thing at a time. The next thing I picked was shoplifting. Why was I addicted to it? How does addiction work? You know, realizing I was addicted <clears throat> to my pharmacopoeia, I could elicit a hormonal response that was rewarding. And there were certain chemicals in my body that I liked to elicit at certain times and not at other times. And I could break that down into an exercise. I turned that into a behavioral exercise. And then I practiced that behavioral exercise until I taught myself not to steal. And then I did that with my agoraphobia. And then I did that with my eating disorder. And each one of these things just one at a time. And you did this while living in a car? Yeah. Yeah, it was the, the time I needed it. You know, again, that's like, there was a lot of other homeless kids. Um, it does wear on you. It's really exhausting to be homeless. All of your time is reduced to getting water, getting food, getting shelter, getting safe. And that's actually really exhausting. But you're reduced yeah. to being a, a, a Neanderthal. But instead of in a forest, you're in a city. But you're just surviving. Just like an animal, like there's no there's no more you're doing. I, I wonder, I mean, over the course of my life, and I'm sure over yours, I've come across young homeless people in cities who could be the next jewel, right? Like a, a young woman, 18, 19 years old, um, a young man, and you just walk past them. And sometimes they're sitting on a corner just talking to themselves and other times they're just staring out there. When you see that, even now, and we're going to talk obviously about your how your life unfolded. Do you do you see yourself in in some of those kids? Definitely. Um, I did a documentary about homelessness, and hmm. one of the biggest like. One of the biggest complaints against homeless kids or homeless adults is they're drug addicts. Do you know how many people in America who have homes and husbands and wives and children and jobs are taking Xanax on the daily because they can't handle the stress of having an income and a family? <laughs> Can you imagine the shit show of stress of having none of that? Mm. who wouldn't turn to drugs like it is a mind-numbing 
soul altering trauma to be homeless. Yeah. To to function every day with the amount of danger and the lack of I remember people walking across the street so that they didn't even have to come by me. Yeah. It's so dehumanizing. I remember people looking at dogs and being like, oh, you're a good little poop. And then they'd look at me and walk by and you're like, God, like dogs are better. Noted. I had to be so vicious in my relentless pursuit of figuring out something that worked for me. When I realized nobody's coming for me, am I coming for me? Am I going to take that on? When I took that mantle on, when I took that responsibility on, when nobody owes me, I owe me, what the F am I willing to do about it? I had to be vicious in that commitment to myself. I had to be unrelenting. It was a fight for life and death. I had to treat it as such. Every day was serious. Me getting out was going to be the hardest thing I ever did. I did not have to get discovered during that time. If I had gotten addicted, if I had gotten into some other stuff, that never would have come out. Like that was a real sink or swim moment for me. And that's the only recommend I work with kids now. And for all of them, it's getting them to that moment where they go, yeah, there's a lot of reasons I shouldn't be happy. But am I going to let that stop me? And yeah, I'm 13. But can I figure out how to be happy, no matter how my parents are treating me? That's a tall order. That's a lot of self-responsibility. That's a lot of self-accountability. But it's the only way I found to not be a victim. It's the only way I found to put myself in a powerful position, even when you're uh, in what looks like a powerless position. I learned how to be powerful when I was homeless, and I knew it. Like, by the time a record label came to see me, I knew I was powerful. I knew I was poor. I knew I was homeless. But when you figure this kind of thing out in your own body, it makes you dangerous in the best mm. way. And I, I knew that. You were, you were writing music, uh, writing songs as well at the time and performing. I mean, uh, there, there, I've, there's so many ways I can ask this question, but I mean, the transition from where, where you were in life and the decisions that you made to try and sort of meet those challenges, right, is very unusual. It's very hard for people to develop that self-motivation. Most people can't do it. They just, it's not that they're weak or powerless. They just, there's something about that hill that is so steep that they just can't climb it. Somehow, for some reason, you were able to do it and not just do it, but to perform. And I wonder when you think back on that transition because it's like it's like going from one world to another in a short period of time do you think that that you what what enabled you to do that was and forgive me for this word but but was it luck did you just have were you just lucky that you had that inner motivation i think it's a combination of factors so like if you're a tree growing you're drawing on the nutrients in the soil you're also yeah. the weather patterns of that year are lucky. And then how you respond to stress, like, will you dig your roots in or will you give up? Like, it's a real combination of things. Um, I came from a pioneer family. I came from gritty people that did hard things. And I was taught to do things. I was taught to work. I was expected to work. Work solved a lot of problems. Yeah. So I was gritty. I was gritty by a young age. I yeah. also had a natural inherent resource of being independent. I was born with it. I, I believe I was born with kind of an independent streak. And that's why I was able to move out. Is because I was like, do I mind being alone in a cabin? I don't. I'd rather be alone in a cabin than hit in a cabin, <laughs> in another cabin. Yeah. yeah. And so I drew on that, you know, when I was homeless there were other homeless kids, but they all gave up. They gave up hope. Oh, I could see it. I couldn't be around it. That's like being around a virus. That's like being around a virus you can't afford to get. And was I willing to pay the price of being alone? Yes, I was. I was willing to not get that virus. I was willing to be alone. Now that became a psychological problem later, because guess what's really hard for me? Connection, right? That became yeah. something I had to solve for later. But you know what? We'll have things to solve for. So 
We all I do. had to figure that out at a at a later date. Getting discovered was an extension of learning to be really thoughtful, learning to stick up for myself. Uh, there were a lot of venues in town that every venue, every venue in San Diego wanted me to pay them wow. because people were getting discovered. And I was like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. I don't want to get discovered. I want to get paid. I need to get paid. I cannot yeah. sing in your coffee place or your restaurant for free. And I should mention, I think this is the early 90s when like everybody is looking for the next Nirvana. So like Stone Temple Pilots were from San Diego. Yeah. And there's a bunch of pri other bands we've never even heard of that were signed to Sub Pop and all these labels because everyone thought there was a gold mine and grunge, right? So I can understand yes. some of these clubs are like, you want to get discovered? Come play here, pay us. Yeah, yeah. I remember every venue wanted the minimum of 200 bucks. And I was like, I literally was like, how is this happening to me? And my friend was playing in a coffee shop. He was really popular. He was a singer songwriter. Let me do his gig with him. I knew I'd at least, I maybe would get door money. Most likely tip money. He was a super nice guy. So I go John in there. Hogan? He no, his name is Gregory Page. He's still mm -hmm. performing. You can look his music up. Okay. He packed the place. This place was packed. It was like a five dollar cover charge. And I settled out my whole life, you know, in bars. So I told him I'll go. Which one's the owner? I'll go settle out. It was this woman. So I go up to her and I said, "Hey, I'm here to settle out for Gregory." And she goes, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "Well, I'm here to whatever get get my money. Like, where's the money?" And she goes, oh, no, we, we keep the door money. And I was like, excuse me? I go, all of it? And she goes, yeah, all of it. And so me, I'm sarcastic. I was like, oh, cool. Well, how much did you make on food and beverage? I'll take that. If you're going to keep the door money, I'll take your food and beverage money. She looked at me incredulously, and she goes, I keep that too. I was livid. I was yeah. so upset because I feel like my friend was getting stolen from and so once I really understood, she goes, oh, no, you sing for tips. Oh, I just saw red. And I remember putting my finger on her face. And I was like, I curse you to fail. You are stealing from the people that helped pack your venue. I was like, you are destined to failure. And I was like, keep your tips. I'm an idiot. I needed the tips. Why didn't I take the tips? We don't know. But that was very in my nature. And I think that's important to success. I think... I didn't like people talking when I sang, even when I street sang. It's my job to make you listen. That's on me. I have to sing long notes or yodel or improvise and talk about what you're wearing to make you stop. But if you're talking just because you're rude, when I'm working that hard, I won't accept it. I just won't. And it's not because I was trying to get signed. It was, it's just like my nature. And I think it takes that. And I see too many musicians that are willing. I see too many human beings that are willing to let their life go, that are just willing to let people talk while they sing or not pay attention or not take you seriously. That wasn't okay with me. And it, I needed it too badly on top of it. It just wasn't casual for me. Um, and so I found a coffee shop with a going out of business sign and I said, hey, how much do you got? Like, can you keep your doors open for a month? Can you pay your bills one month? Will you give me a month? And if I bring, your pe if I bring enough people in here in a month, I get the door money, all of it, every dollar. You get the coffee and food and beverage. And her name was Nancy. And we shook hands. And that was it. I started going to the boardwalk and passing out flyers and street singing and saying see me every thursday and i picked like every thursday i'd be there every thursday even though i was homeless like i'll be there every thursday and i built an audience it was just by then, doing that by by yeah. performing the streets handing out flyers. i mean i've seen you perform obviously you have a beautiful voice and and probably you were a little different than the average street performer people were like stopping and listening to you yeah because again you have to make them it's gimmicks. You know, it can be authentic, but yeah. yodeling is weird. It makes people stop. Or You, you would yodel? Mm-hmm. Or I would, my dad taught me to improvise in bars. So I would go, uh, Mr. Joe on the red shirt, walking by, treats me like a piece of dirt. I just make up a lyric about somebody and make them stop. Be like, is she talking about me? Uh, um, 
My first show was for two people. Like I did a five hour set because I thought you did five hour sets because I'm an idiot. I did a five hour set of the most emotional, vulnerable, long songs as a social experiment because I wanted, I wanted to not be alone. And I realized I went back to a nice Nina Mikowski and I said, I, I will always feel alone if I never tell the truth. So I wrote songs that were so honest. These poor two surfers that probably just thought I was cute sat through a five hour show. We all were crying. It was the dumbest like thing, but I wasn't rejected. They were like, holy crap. We feel like we can't believe we're two dudes. And we cried. And I didn't realize we'd have so much in common. And it made me feel less alone. And then the next week at Thursday, it was four people. And the next week, it was seven people. And the next week, it was 20 people. Wow. And then in the course of six months, it turned into standing room only and then double shows. And then I'd say within six or seven months, labels showing up. So it was really, I mean, you were really methodically, I mean, building up an audience like like somebody build a business, essentially. I mean, you probably weren't thinking of it, of it that way, but you were really, you weren't just showing up and hoping people would come. Like you figured out how to make that happen. Strategy is really important. Yeah. You know, agriculture teaches you that. Like when you put a seed in the ground, don't do it unless you're going to water it. It's really stupid. It's a waste of your time. So again, I think being raised on the land and I think nature is physics. It is physics. That's real. Nature is real. And if you're not in alignment to nature and natural law, you're wasting your time. And so I just looked at myself as a seed. Like, what does watering this mean? And I needed Nancy to win, right? I needed Nancy who was giving me a venue. She had to win too. So I had, I had to think of a way to make this ecosystem work. And I had to make it work for me emotionally, where I didn't feel like a liar, where I didn't, where I didn't feel inauthentic, where I was doing it based on me and who I was as a person and what my values were. And it's because I had the most unsexy life motto of all time that I got from a tree that was hardwood grows slowly. Like, I don't want to be the softwood that grows quickly and falls over. I want to do something that lasts. And so the second I started making music and that started being serious, I wanted to have a strategy. So when labels came to see me, I, it was, again, this, like, danger. Very dangerous for a kid like me with my background to suddenly live a new lifestyle. It's very dangerous. Very few people make that transition. And I saw every bio doc <laughs> and read bio docs. People like me don't do well in the music industry. Very few people do no, well very few. in the music industry. And so if I was going to engage yeah. in a very dangerous thing, I had to have a good plan. And that meant being very strategic about really practical things. Yeah. I mean, not only do they not la make it, but very rarely have an enduring career. And they don't live. The odds. Right. They, don't they live. mostly right. die. Like, yeah. that's bad. I didn't want to die. Well, <laughs> you, um, there was a bidding war to sign you, and you were eventually signed by Atlantic. I think you were probably 21. I mean, just help, help me understand how you, when you go back and you think of that time, I mean, going from, from having nothing to a bidding war to sign you to a major label, I mean, did, did you even have time to sort of reflect on how just insane, just crazy that was. Just what a strange turn of events. Or did it seem like a natural progression for you, given that, you know, you're playing at coffee houses and that you were building up an audience? I was 19 when I got discovered. It was surreal. Like, I remember Nancy being like, Jewel, Sony, I think it was Atlantic that first came. Jewel, Atlantic Records called. They're going to come tonight to your 8 o'clock show. And I was like, interesting. And in a coffee shop of all, you know, surfer culture, there's like two suits. And you're like, you two must be from the record label. Five hour show. Don't let anybody use the restroom until my break. You know, halfway through it. If they talked, I would call them out. Um, and then it was Sony. And then it was RCA. And then it was Arista. And then it was every, every single label. Wow. And it was very weird. It was like, it was a Cinderella moment. It was, 
bizarre, um, scary. I went to the library and I asked for a book about the music business, and there was one book on the shelves. <laughs> and? and it was by, by Donald Passenheim called Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business. And I was like, that'll mm. work. And it taught me about contracts. It taught me about royalties, mechanicals, um, the whole system, how the whole thing worked. And that was really helpful. Um, so I now had like, you know, what was I solving for? I'm solving for, I do want a career, but I just learned how to be happy. I don't want a career at the sake of being happy. So it's not at any yeah. cost. So what is the cost? You know, what am I willing to pay? What price am I willing to pay? And then how can I build a strategy to create an environment, to create an outcome I hope to have? And so money had a big part of, to do with that. Um, yeah. I was offered a million dollar signing bonus. And that wasn't a solve to my problems. That actually was a problem I had to solve. Because as I read the book, I realized it was, well, I knew nothing's for free, right? You don't grow up on a ranch and think, oh, somebody's going to hand out a million dollars. What was the cost? The book taught me the cost. And the cost was very high. I owed that money back through record sales. The way record sales work is you get a, a fraction. Yeah. Not very much, a fraction of a dollar on every record sale. Then to promote a career would probably take a couple million dollars on top of that. Let's say at minimum to break my first record, it would cost me maybe $3 million. I could just do the math on how many records I had to sell to break even. Yeah. It was a very high number of records. Yeah. Now, I had to look at my environment. What was working in the music business? Grunge. What was I? Not grunge. Yeah. And so... The same way I didn't think singing was about me, you know, as a kid, it was just about the novelty of my age. I felt like I had a real audience reaction. You can't fake that. I knew that. I knew I could get that reaction out of people. Did that mean the bidding war was about me? Not really. I think yeah. it became a competition about each other. And so don't take that personal. Don't get arrogant. Get what you want out of this moment. And what I wanted was A, to learn if happiness was a buildable skill. Two, I wanted a music career. I wanted a 60-year career. Hmm. Now, how do I solve for that? So I made kind of a hierarchical, what I call my North Star decision. Number one, I had to learn to be a happy whole human, not a human full of holes, which meant I'd have a business plan for that. That meant I had to be accountable. It meant I had to be able to audit it. I had to have increments of measurements of was I doing better or was I doing worse? And that I would always put that above my career. And then number two, my job was to be a musician. And then what did I want out of being a musician? I wanted to be an artist more than I wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to make all my decisions based on that hierarchy. And it started right away. It started with turning the money down. It started with taking the biggest back end anybody had ever been given in the music business. And for every million albums I would sell, it went up a whole point. It was a really cool deal. Now, it didn't mean anything, and I got my necessities covered. I got rent covered. So now I wasn't surviving. I could move my mom and my brother in. And then I had to make an authentic record, not a popular record. So I turned down yeah. all the hit producers, all the pop producers. I found Ben Keith, who did Harvest and Harvest Moon with Neil Young. I made a very simple folk music, mostly live at the coffee shop because I didn't even know how to be with a band. And I wasn't going to be something I wasn't. I couldn't figure out how to play in time with a band. That was yeah. life. And so that's how that album became live. And then I turned down the real world, the very first big reality TV show. My label was like, Jewel, you'll go from being homeless to moving into this house to making your album on camera. You're going to be famous before you even they, they launch the you album. They wanted to be a character on the real world, the first. Yeah, that was my or... first gig. That was my first real offer. Wow. Yeah. I hadn't even made and, my album yeah. yet. And they would basically, you'd be one of the people in the house who was an up and coming singer. I mean, that could have been a huge, and you sign this deal where all of the upside goes to you if it works, but the chances that that first record pieces of you was going to be successful was not guaranteed. I mean, just because, just because of the way the industry works. I mean, how many people were signed the same year you were signed who also had really good albums, but just, they never took off. So there was a lot of risk you were taking on by making yeah. those, those choices. 
Yeah, but they were in alignment with my hierarchical decision making. And if you're going to create a decision making process, you better be loyal to it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, what else is it for? And so, again, turn down the money. You look at this thing. Well, okay, I made an authentic record. Good. Would it help an authentic record to be on a hit reality TV show? Probably. Would it be too quick? Probably. Does hardwood grow slowly? Yes. If something grows too quickly, especially when I don't have the internal orchestra architecture to handle that kind of rapid growth, would I do well? Would that serve my number one job of being happy? Would I like to live in a home where I'm filmed 24 seven with my panic attacks and shit? <laughs> right. No. So I stayed really loyal. A, it wouldn't make me happy. I knew I'd suffer psychologically. B, it was going to be too quick. God forbid it work, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. God forbid it work. Go slow, stay loyal to slow, steady growth. I turn it down and I fail for two years. For two it was years. Awful. Uh, and in other words, I mean, fail, but presumably you're working on this record that would become pieces of you. I mean, you're, I have to imagine you're writing songs and you're trying them out. So when you say failure, what exactly does that mean? Because I would think you're, it's the process of putting that record together. It was already together. Um, hmm. It didn't take long to make the record. So I think by the time I was... until 1995. Yeah, so... Yeah, I forget the years, but when it released, I failed for two more years. Um... Or I made the album in 94. We waited a long time to put it out. I did a lot of grassroots touring. Uh, I did a thousand shows a year. I was doing five and six shows a day. I was doing two cities a day. I was trying to recreate what I did in San Diego by being in Philadelphia every Tuesday, DC every Wednesday, New York every wow. whatever. I did circuits like that. And they went a big fat nowhere. Like, I think I sold 2,000 albums in a year and a half. It's, and they were probably all in San Diego. It's unbelievable because, of course, anyone who knows you or is a fan of you knows that record went like 12 times platinum. But the first year, nobody bought it. Yeah. What? What? I mean, it was, I mean, clearly people loved it because it went 12 times platinum and you were very smart in the contract you signed. But it turned out. But but what happened? I mean, why? How did it go from 2000? you know, albums sold in the first nine months to 12X Platinum. I wasn't what was happening. I knew that. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew I'd have that to come up against. And, you know, our industry isn't great at seeing outliers. No. There are some special people in this industry with very good ears, you know, and they really do see the next thing. But people don't typically, you know, radio isn't or whatever. They just it isn't really quick to adopt me when Nirvana is the biggest thing, you know, or adopt yeah. whatever Adele when whatever else is the biggest thing prior well, to that. Well, at that time, you know? it was probably like Bush or, yeah. you know, like I'm trying to think who was late 90s big rock. It was. Bands. It was Catherine Wheel. It was Belly. It was Hole. It was Bush. It was Stone Temple Pilots. It was, you know, and then yeah. real pop music you know, on the, on the other side. Uh, yeah. But mostly, yeah, just all grunge. Yeah, all rock. Um, what happened was college radio, grassroots, relentless, nonstop, three hours of sleep a night, a thousand shows a year for several years. And then I quit. We tried to get Whole Save Your Soul going. We tried to get Your Mint For Me going. N none of them worked. Finally, after, I'd say two years, probably all in, I started making a second album and I, I was a little scrambling. I, I was starting to lose faith on my little hierarchical decision making. I was like, mm, whew, I don't know. Um, I could write grunge, you know, like, what do I need to do here? And then Bob Dylan wanted to tour with me. And so I put the record on hold on my musicians. I'm like, let's take two weeks off. I'll be back in two weeks. And his tour manager was like, Mr. Dylan doesn't watch the opening act. He doesn't meet the opening act. And I was like, I get it. I'm here to do my shows. And as we've already, you know, made clear, I don't like people talking when I sing. And so 
I would kick people out of shows. And so I did that at Dylan's shows. You know, I would do everything I could. And then I would say, look, I'm, I'm right here. I hear you all talking. I'm alone on stage. Like, I get that you're not here to see me. I respect that. But if you want to talk, would you go out in the lobby? And I would wait. And if somebody wouldn't stop, listen, I would stop and I would kick them out. Like, personally, you in the red shirt, you are invited to leave. And this was just what I'd always done. I didn't think a lot of it. But after about five nights, his tour manager came up to me and was like, Mr. Dylan has been watching your shows and he wants to meet you. Hmm. And so I go down there and he's like, so I hear you're kicking people out of my shows. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> he loved it. He loved that I was this kid that was like, nope, get out. And yeah. it intrigued him and is what made him listen to my music. It wasn't even my music. It was that I was kicking people out. But he ended up mentoring me and really taking me under his wing. And I was really faltering at this time. And he was like, are you a folk singer? Are you a singer-songwriter? Do you have a choice? Because you have a choice. Maybe you're not. And maybe you should do something else. And I was like, yes, sir. I am a songwriter, sir. I am. And he was like, you may never be famous. I was like, no, sir. I may never not, sir. <laughs> like, and he gave me books to listen, read, and uh, read, and music to listen to. And I just remember being like, you know what? If Bob Dylan is the only one that likes my music, we're done. Like, we're good. You're done. We're yeah. done. And he really encouraged me to keep going. And he was like, don't get a band. Stay solo acoustic. Stay with that record. It's who you are. You don't have a choice to be who you are. Like, yeah. it may not work. But are you or aren't you this? And then Neil Young took me out next. And a similar thing. I was opening for him at the garden, solo acoustic. In front of Crazy Horse. Like, yeah. an epic, heavy band with Marshall staff. I don't know if everybody knows. Like, he had, you know amps up to the ceiling like 30 yeah. feet high and i was walking through this mutual space he and i never really talked and he goes you look nervous and i was like i am i am nervous he goes why <laughs> and i was like because you're neil young with crazy horse and i'm solo acoustic at madison square garden they're gonna murder me <laughs> and he stuck his little shaky finger in my face he goes this is just another hash house on the road to success. You get out there and you show them no respect. And I was like, <laughs> yes, sir. And did something unusual that night. I went out and I started with the quietest song. I have a song called Angel Standing By. It's all in a, like a vibratoless falsetto. Mm -hmm. It's quiet. It's a little aria, almost lullaby. And I went over where I'm supposed to go out onto his key stage. Took a long time for the spotlight to find me, which is good. Because it makes the whole audience be like, what's happening? Where is she yeah. going? Yeah. Why can't the spotlight find her? And then I sang so quiet that the whole room shushed itself because they couldn't hear me. And it worked. It freaking yeah. worked. And I felt like, you know, I felt like a superpower human after that. I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, being a 14-year-old kid reading these books from other parts of the world that really connected with you because they spoke to you. Um, very clearly. And and I, I imagine that's probably what happened with Who Will Save Your Soul. That book spoke the song, the lyrics of that song, and the way it was sung spoke to people. When they heard it, it was it felt it it felt um like there was an emotional connection maybe. I mean I, I you may not be able to answer that question of why, but I think that's probably what happened. I think nothing's more interesting than the truth. Hmm. You know, what's the Joseph Campbell quote? It's a privilege of a lifetime to be yourself. If you want to be liked, try being radically honest. It's endearing. It's relatable. Because there's just not a human alive that doesn't feel fear and jealousy and greed. And I knew in the coffee shops... But I knew before that, when I was writing the poems that I was writing as a kid, I knew I wanted to be honest. Those were my heroes. That's what saved my life. Like, yeah. was their honesty. And so I knew who I wanted to be as a writer. And it was to figure out to be myself. And that is a process of discovery, but it's also a commitment in your writing. We all can trade, right? I get paid. 
artists, right? When once we become professional, we're 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 paid. And so what am I trading on? We get to choose. You know, a lot of my industry trades on selling you beauty. Yeah. It trades on selling you sexuality. It trades on being one of the popular girls and it makes you feel like you're one too. Mm -hmm. Lots of things you get to trade on, but you might as well know what you're trading yeah. on. And for me, I just knew it was authenticity. I wasn't cool. I wasn't trying to be cool. I wasn't calculated. I was strategic, but about what I cared about. It wasn't strategic in how you perceived me. I was really just trying to be honest and that was it. And so it was kind of honesty that ended up being what my career was built on, which is very lucky because if somebody like me ends up being um, rewarded for fakeness, that would have done my head in. And that happens to a lot of celebrities. Like we feel fake, like the imposter syndrome is inauthentic syndrome. You know, if you're yeah. really being authentic, you can't feel like an imposter. Did you, you know, uh, you mentioned this idea that that you wanted an enduring career. You wanted to be the hardwood tree, not the softwood tree that grew quickly and then fell over. And you did that. I mean, here we are, you know, 26, 30, almost 30 years later, you know, since you were signed, 30 years later since you were signed and almost 30 years since Pieces of You came out. And you're still making music. You still perform in front of huge audiences. You're still... Um, you have a fan base and you and and in that time, I mean, not only have you released a lot of albums, but you took a period of time off to be a mom, just to kind of focus on your child and to do those things. Um, what do you I mean? And again, it's a question you may not be able to answer, but is it is it about this idea that you stuck to this commitment, like you made a commitment to have a plan when you were 19? And that was what you stuck to, this sort of very clear set of goals, principles, and values. And that's why you are where you are now? The simple answer is yes. But the longer answer is my number one goal is to be happy. And my life kept dealing me blows. Yeah. And I had to take time off my career to handle that so I wouldn't have a, a mental breakdown. Hmm. The first two-year break I took at the height of my fame was right after Spirit. So I had a hit record, Pieces of You, and then I had a follow-up hit record with Spirit. Yeah. And I quit. Very few people know that. It was just um, too much, just the, the fame and the dealing with the pressure of being you, of, of trying to be this public person. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. Yeah. I never thought I'd get as famous as I did. I got, you know, cover of Time magazine can't walk across the street, bodyguards, yeah. constant death threats, can't go grocery shopping. I hated it. It was not yeah. good for my writing. I'm a voyeur. I like to watch people to write. I, I don't like to be watched. <laughs> it's terrible. And I had to give myself permission, and I quit for two years to just see, would I rather be a chef? Would I rather be a photographer? If I save my money, I never have to do this again. What do I want? And I realized I just didn't like fame a lot. Sorry. It's like, am I going to lie and do a life I hate because I worked so hard to get yeah. here and because everybody expects me to? Or am I going to just fess up? I just fessed up. I hated it. Maybe I hated music. I wasn't sure. And so it took me two years to figure that out. Turns out I loved music. I just didn't like the fame. And in two years, my fame went down so much that by the end of that two years, I could grocery shop. And I was like, hmm. I just figured out the hack to making this work for me which is taking big breaks between albums and killing my momentum, killing my fame, dropping out of the public eye, learning, growing, reading, and doing something new and interesting to me. So just like in school, I would just do something I wasn't good at. I would do a genre I didn't know about. Not strategically thinking this will be reinventing myself. It was just, I could suck at this, but it's interesting to me. And I made a lot of money and I don't have to, ever win financially again if I just save it. Yeah. So that's how I started to go about my career. And then the thing went down with my mom. That was brutal. That this took me your mom years who was your, to- who was your manager for some time and, and there was essentially, she embezzled It was bad. I, I realized I was, I realized I was 3 million in debt and not 
a hundred million dollar in profit when I was 34. And I was about to make the riskiest album of my career, a pop album, which I knew coming from the 90s credibility singer songwriter world, like you don't get to make pop albums. I knew it'd be so, you know, contested, but I wanted to. And yeah. here I was realizing during the recording of that album that my mom isn't who I thought she was. Whew, that all the money was gone. It was this awful. Is in, this is in 2006, 2007 when you Three, four, the, 2004, the, three, okay. 2003. And, it was while I was she, making the album. She had been your manager and uh, and obviously mismanaged your money. And I know this is probably a sensitive topic, but I think the two of you are you, – you just don't have a relationship any, yeah. anymore. Yeah. Last time I saw her – this is in my book, but it was – the last time I saw her was in a lawyer's office where she mm -hmm. said, I'm really grateful I can just go back to being your mom now. And I knew I'd never see her again, and yeah. I haven't. Um, and it's the best thing I ever did. It was the most life-affirming, self-loving thing I've ever done. Yeah. And I had a lot to heal from. And thank God intuition was a hit. I mean, the odds. Do you know how hard it is to write in every genre? It's very hard. Yeah. To write a hit in every genre? Really flipping hard. And then I set myself an even more impossible task. I wanted to write a pop song that wasn't about love. Yeah. There's not many of those. You can't count very many on one hand. And it worked. I wrote a song about intuition. At the, I mean, it was so improbable at work. I was about to go do a big tour. And I called up. I had Irving Ace off as my new manager. And I mm -hmm. called him. I said, I can't do it. And he said, are you okay? And I said, I think I will be. Mm -hmm. I canceled one of the most lucrative tours of my career. I'll probably never be in that size venue again, by the way. Like, you pay a price. Like, and that's the thing I really want to impress upon people is this is hierarchical. Yeah. Sometimes they're pitted against each other. I did have to choose my happiness, and I did let go of money. I let go of prestige and venue size and all kinds of things that if I wanted to pick my career and fame, oh, my God, I shouldn't have let go of that tour. But I wasn't going to make it. I couldn't yeah. handle psychologically what I was trying to process psychologically without taking time. And it took me time. And it took me a long time to crawl back out of that. How have you, I mean, given the childhood you had, right? And, and obviously there was a lot of trauma and a lot of pain, but you also, as you described yourself, were, there was a lot of grit. You had to work. You had to work the land. You had to make money to pay your bills. And that, that probably was a superpower that enabled you to, to come out of, of, of your situation when you were homeless. Um, but how did your experience as a parent, as a child, inform your experience as a parent now? I think you've got a 12-year-old the same age as my younger son. Um, I've got a 14, a 12-year-old. And I wonder how – and most of that time you were, you've were you been raising him as a single mom because I know you split from his dad. Yeah. Um. Every day I say, may the healing of the mother be the healing of the child. Mm -hmm. um, I love healing. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's creative. A lot of the stuff I wrote were behavioral exercises. Mm -hmm. They weren't songs. They were just practicable things. For me, there was a moment when I was like, 13 and I was in Alaska and I was sitting on a cliff very depressed sat there for eight or so hours watched the tide go out a mile come in a mile it came in and out so slowly so imperceptibly one centimeter at a time that you don't notice it until at the end of eight hours you're like holy smokes that went out a mile and came in a mile hmm. and that changed my life because I felt so sad I felt like my sadness would be forever. Hmm. And when I watched that tide take all that time to come in and out, it dawned on me that the culmination of nature, of physics, is change. And I'm part of nature. I'm part of physics. It mm -hmm. would be impossible for my bad mood not to change. I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know how slow that'll go. But it would be outside of physics for it not to change. And suddenly it just changed my whole perception. I called it emotional impermanence. It was impermanent. How I felt was impermanent. Could I outlast it? Right? I had to be conscious 
That's hard. It's hard to be conscious while you're that miserable. But when I stopped worrying that what if something's wrong with me? What if I'll never feel better? What if it'll never change? That was arrogant. It was an arrogant thing to suppose that I alone and all of nature and all of physics existed outside of the law of physics. Hmm. And so it would have to change. Maybe I could even help it change quicker. Now that I wasn't worrying about, was I broken? What if I could take all that emotional energy and go be curious and say, could I help it change quicker? What if I sleep? What if I get hmm. more sleep? What if I need less sleep? What if I wake up and work? What if I wake up and work out? And then you become a scientist that's engaged in your own life. Yeah. And the most rebellious part of my nature, because I am rebellious, I am competitive. Learning how to funnel that in a way that made me win was a real secret to life. You know, I don't want to die. Yeah. I want to be happy. That's actually what I want. And so what am I willing to do about that? I refuse to die unhappy. I refuse to be more famous than I am happy. That is not success. Yeah. So you have to learn to, to channel. All of us has the stubbornness in us. It's just learning to channel that stubbornness that works for you. How do you, I mean, I love this idea that, that writing for you is an exercise and just kind of working through ideas and also it's a mental exercise, you know, and I think I'm just picking a random song, Stronger Woman, for example. I'm going to uh, I'm going to love myself more than anyone else. Right. And so you can see that you're I mean, you can once you, you know that what you just said and then you look at those lyrics, you can understand that and make sense. And now, I mean, as somebody who obviously has spent so much time thoughtfully working on themselves and and from the time you were a child learning about stoicism through all of those trials. And now here you are, a mom, you know, entering your 50s and still making music and writing music. Still the same thing? Is it still about working through? Is, are they still mental exercises when you put pen to paper? For me, it is. Um, you know, Stronger Woman, I was trying to give myself the courage to get a divorce. Mm. I mean, that was, that, was, that was me trying to say, choose you. This is going badly. <laughs> and now you see it. What You yeah. see it in those lyrics. Yeah. And then you start making a record and you're like, maybe that song would work at radio too. Maybe. <laughs> but it's the same. You know, I started a business and it's like my music was always solve a problem for me. Yeah. And it solved a problem for other people. Who will save your soul helped other people. That's really cool. But I didn't do it to help people. I did it to help me. Um, yeah. It's a side effect of solving a complicated problem for yourself. My company's the same way. It's all in mental health. And mm -hmm. it was me going, what do I do with pain? And now it's, how do I help other people with pain? Um, I do have to say that, you know, my career isn't what I could have done if I didn't have the emotional shit to deal with. Yeah. If I didn't have to quit to deal with my mom if I didn't have to quit after my divorce. My career would be doing something different, but that's okay. I really want to impress upon people that we do pay prices. And it brings me to tears because it's so beautiful. To choose that price, like to choose my son, is so powerful. And what's funny is I was so shamed for it in the industry. Jewel lost her touch. Jewel can't hack it. You, the amount of articles that came out, I mean, when I know in my body it's an act of power, just like me quitting after spirit. Tons of articles written on how I can't hack it and you name it. Same with uh, taking the risk on the pop album. People thought I quit out of shame for my pop album. I quit because yeah. I was, couldn't handle what was going on with my mom. I'm proud of that album. And so... That's okay because I love my career and I can still keep solving for my career. And building a business got to be more interesting than making albums. I'm writing lots of music. I don't publish it. I don't know what I'll do about that. I don't know if I'll start publishing more music. I don't know if I'll, I don't know. It just, it's kind of like when we were talking about me in high school. It's like art just got really interesting. Right now, building this company is really interesting and I have work to do on my career to keep yeah. my goal of wanting a 60-year career. I still have to make good on that. 
I don't think I've made good on it. I do know I'm writing lethally well right now. Nobody's hearing it. Mm -hmm. But that was hard. I'm getting to your question slowly of like what it's like to write now. For me, yeah. writing now, I really had to fight for it in a different way. And it was on, I put an album out maybe two years ago called Freewheeling Woman. And it's the very first album I ever wrote from scratch. First time in my whole life. I've had thousands of songs, thousands of songs in my back catalog. So if I wanted a country album, I went through my back catalog. I didn't write an album. If I wanted a pop album, yeah. I went through my back catalog. Wow. This, I wanted to be a 40, how old was I? 46, 47. I wanted to be a 47 year old grown ass single mother of one. <laughs> I wanted it to be yeah. who I was because I didn't see many women writing from that place of ownership and power and not pretending to be younger and not trying to recreate you were meant for me or hands. And that was hard. It was very, yeah. very hard. I had a lot of work to do psychologically. And so the songs I wrote were a real reflection of my psychology of ownership, of empowerment, of finding out who I am now not who I was then and trying to recreate it in music. You mentioned Inner World, which is your, um, your, your platform that allows people to, to work through mental health challenges, obviously connected to your own, your own journey. And I know you do a lot of work with a foundation that you've started and you raise a lot of money for um, you know, causes around kids and obviously involved in mental health. And it seems like, I mean, you mentioned this idea of like choices you make, you made, right? Um, to be a mom and to focus, which to me, there's no, there's as a dad, like there's no question you would choose that over, you know, $10 million or, you know, bigger stadium tours. Like there's just no, there's no question that the child is a more interesting and more fulfilling choice and a better one. But I also, it also strikes me that your story is also about a legacy, right? It's not about Jewel who became this well-known pop singer, folk singer, and had this career, but it's like, you really want to make an impact in, in places that, that you maybe couldn't have done without this sort of quote-unquote celebrity that does enable, enable that, and it's how you're kind of using that. I don't know. I see it much more like high school. Like, sculpture <laughs> just got really interesting to me. <laughs> Solving... Suicidal ideation is very hard. Yeah. It's a complex problem. And I thought singing was complex. It is. I still find it really, really interesting. I'm still learning about how to sing. I like complicated problems. I've learned. I even get rewarded. Like, my life's rewarded me for learning how to solve complicated problems for myself. Career is a complicated problem. I think when I was 22 or 23, I wanted to see could what worked for me help other kids that didn't have therapy. How do you help people without therapy? That's hard. How did I help me without therapy? I never did it. It was hard to figure out. And I like hard problems. And once you suffer like I suffered, lots of people suffer like me. It's not that unique. But it's usually us that tries to help because we just know we know the value. If, if somebody helped me, I knew what that meant to me. If I can help somebody else, I knew what that meant to them. It's not about legacy at all. It's just, I know I was put on the planet to help. I do know that. I was born with that. I always felt that. That might just be helping your neighbor. It's My fans call themselves everyday angels because I really, that's how I've tried to live my life. It ended up on bigger and bigger stages, but it wasn't because I tried to be. It's because my life has been a natural extension of following my curiosity. And, and fighting for those things that I was passionate about that mattered to me. My foundation, you know, that was trying to solve mental health issues 22 years ago when mental health wasn't a word, when all the parents were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we have one of the hop, top success rates in the world helping kids with suicidal ideation. And we don't wow. use therapy. I'm not against therapy, by the way. I love therapy. It just isn't yeah. available. And that's unacceptable that we're going to leave people behind. Not, uh, no. No, not, not why I could do something about it. Not happening. I'm not leaving me behind. And I don't want to leave anyone behind. Not when it's solvable. And that just started to be interesting to me. Fascinating. 
how do you make this work? How do you make this work for group, a group of people and not one person one on one? How do you make that scalable? But that's all an extension of my creativity. It's the same song. It's still who will save your soul. Who will save your soul if you don't save your own? It's all the same thing I'm thinking about. It's just thinking about it and art in a different way. I, I see my foundation as artistic and I see my business as artistic. I see it as a song. It's just a really, it's like writing an essay is so different than short story fiction. This is just a really yeah. different kind of thing I'm trying to write. That's amazing. Jewel, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed talking with you. Hey, thanks for watching my conversation with singer-songwriter Jewel. She recently released the 25th anniversary edition of her record, Spirit, with 24 bonus tracks. You can find all the show notes for this episode by visiting thegreatcreators.com slash Jewel. You can find all of our episodes there, including conversations with people like Carrie Brownstein and Bjork and Melissa Etheridge and Stephen Colbert and Tom Hanks and so many others. You can find that all at thegreatcreators.com. You can also hear our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search The Great Creators and click follow. It's free. Thank you for listening. I'm Guy Raz. And check out some more episodes of the show coming up very soon.